Okay, today we're going to talk about rotational spectroscopy, but we're going to focus on rho vibrational spectra and try to understand where the intensities of the various peaks come from. So in the previous lecture, we talked about how these transitions between different vibrational states of a different electronic state lead to two different branches in a rho vibrational spectrum. So remember now, this is using infrared light here to probe vibrational transitions. But within that vibrational transition, there's going to be different rotational transitions. So J here are the rotational transitions that are happening. So each of these six different arrows here will be six different peaks in the spectra, okay? Three of those from the P branch on the left, which is lower energies, because those are the delta J minus one transitions. And the P branch on the right, three blue arrows, will be three of these peaks, which are the delta J plus one transitions. Okay, so there is no zero to zero transition. There is no arrow from zero to zero, because that does not obey the selection rule that we derived in a previous lecture for rho vibrational spectroscopy. Okay, so we talked about last time uh, the spacings between these peaks and how the spacing between these peaks has something to do with the rotational constant B. And we further talked about as you go up in energy to these larger states, okay, your equilibrium bond length is actually increasing. So as you go to higher energies, this equilibrium bond length increases, which means B decreases. So the longer arrows here, that is the R branch over here, is going to have spacings that are closer together than the pre P branch because of this higher energy effect, shorter equilib longer equilibrium bond length, lower amount of rotational constant, and the spacing between energy peaks, delta peaks, we'll say, is equal to this or proportional to this rotational parameter. So that's all sort of review from last lecture. What we want to focus on now is explaining why is the shape of the overall curve like this? Yes, these are individual peaks. I'm just pointing out a curve if I was, you know, going to connect all the peaks, which usually you would not, but I want to understand that shape, which would be this mathematical function, right? I know why there's a gap in the middle, again, because that's the forbidden transition. So let's think about and try to explain, right, where these peak shapes come from. So if we think about those peaks, they're each coming from an exact starting delta J state, or starting J state, a starting rotational state. And the number of molecules that undergo that transition, and thus the intensity of the peak, is dependent on the thermal population of that level. Okay, so the length of the arrow here shows you the difference in energy, hence where the peak will be on this x-axis, but it doesn't tell you anything about the intensity, and the intensity will have something to do with, well, how many molecules are there in this ground state that can undergo this transition? And if there's not very many molecules, then the intensity of the peak won't be very large, right? So this is not done on a single molecule. You always have a collection of molecules in this spectroscopy. And so we're trying to understand the intensity of this peak from what will be a thermal distribution of these molecules. So the intensity of the peak in this rho vibrational spectrum, we'll say the peak intensity is proportional to the thermal population of that state. Now, back when we discussed strictly vibrational transitions without considering rotations, we really only considered the n equals zero vibrational state, the ground state, because at 300 Kelvin, that's really the only one populated. But remember, rotational states are packed much more close together. So it's not just j equals zero I have to worry about in rotational transitions. It's j equals one, two, three, and probably more, even at 300 Kelvin. So all of these J states are populated. That's gonna give rise to a bunch of different peaks. The intensity of the peak depends on the thermal population of that J level. So how do we think about 
population and thermal population. Okay, that's our good buddy Boltzmann, who taught us all about this. Okay, the Boltzmann distribution in a population analysis. So, if we wanted to think about maybe the number of molecules in J equals 1, compared to the number of molecules in J equals zero. This is gonna be a formula we have learned at one time, but it's been a long time in, in this course in physical chemistry. But we did talk about this and it has something to do with, well, this exponential. What is the energy of this J1 state? We'll call it E1 over the Boltzmann constant times temperature. And this is going to be divided by the energy of the ground state over KBT, the temperature, probably 300 Kelvin. But there's also one other thing. It depends on the degeneracy of that level. Okay, so it's gonna depend on the degeneracy. We use the letter G for degeneracy of state one over the degeneracy of state zero, okay? And we could combine these together to make this slightly simpler expression that looks like this. And again, this is the Boltzmann distribution, which will tell us something about the relative populations of the J equals one to J equals zero state. So let's first think about this exponential term, okay? E1 is higher in energy than E naught, so that means this delta energy is positive. Boltzmann constant, well, that's positive. Temperature, of course, is in Kelvin, the best temperature scale, and that will then be positive as well. And so if each of these are positive, then this is clearly an exponential decay, which is what we're used to seeing with Boltzmann populations, right? The ground state, the lowest energy state, should be the most populated at higher energy states we should see lower populations. Okay, so exponential decay here for this part, right? We've neglected the degeneracy, right? Which is going to factor into this overall distribution of these two populations. So let's think about what is the degeneracy of rotational states? And that might be hard to think about, but remember that we've talked about rotations with a model of rotation known as the rigid rotor. And that rigid rotor applies to both these types of molecular motion, how these atoms are spinning around one another and rotating, but it also has to do with how an electron orbits a nucleus in that classical Bohr model of the atom. So if we think about our orbital angular momentum, we know there's two L plus one degeneracy, right? Because L equals zero is S, and there's one orbital. And for L equals one, that is P, and there is three orbitals. And for L equals two, that's D, that is five orbitals. So we're very familiar with this notion that degeneracy in terms of energy of angular momentum states is two L plus one. And we use that in thinking about electrons orbiting a nucleus and the orbitals they're in and the degeneracy of those orbitals. There's three energetically degenerate p orbitals. But this rigid rotor model that gave us all this information is the same rigid rotor model we use for rotations, which means rotational states have two J plus one degeneracy. Okay, so we know this ratio of molecules in J equals one to molecules equals J equals over, sorry, molecules in J equals one divided by molecules in the J equals zero state is dependent on the degeneracy here and the exponential decay, 
we know exponential decay means there should be less molecules in the first excited state just from an energetic standpoint. But the degeneracy favors the excited states, right? Because if J equals zero, how many states are there? One, same as over here. In the first excited rotational state, there's a degeneracy of three. So in this example, three over one. So this is clearly going to favor the excited state in terms of the population. And this goes back to sort of an entropy argument, right? Yes, the lowest energy, the ground state is usually preferred and that's how we think of things in chemistry and science in general. But it often neglects entropy, which is the number of spots the molecule can take, right? The degeneracy of those states. It's a statistical argument. There's more energy levels associated with the J equals one state, three, then there is with the J equals zero state, one. And so from an entropy standpoint, J equals one is favored, even though energetically it's not. And so it's going to be a battle in terms of the rotational level population. So the rotational uh, level population is a battle between increasing degeneracy from this 2j plus 1 rule, because I want to expand this now just to not the first versus the zeroth state, but as I go up to all the other states, j equals 2, 3, 4, etc., degeneracy is going to favor all of those. But energetically, those aren't going to be preferred. So it's a, a battle between this increasing degeneracy 2j plus 1 and this decreasing, or I should just say, and this exponential decay. from the higher energy, okay? So at first, what I'll say is when the J levels, as I'm thinking about them in this electronic Morse potential that has vibrational levels, N equals zero and N equals one, and within those there are these J levels, zero, zero, one, two, three, J equals zero, one, two, three. Okay, the number of molecules in each of these states is going to affect the peak height that I see for a given transition in row vibrational spectra, because if there's a ton of molecules down here, that's gonna be the most intense peak. But, the population depends on the increasing degeneracy, which favors the higher J's. Suppose I could label these. 0, 1, 2, 3. J equals 0, 1, 2, 3. But they're higher in energy, which means they're not favored due to exponential decay. So what we can see at first is when the levels are closely spaced together, and so there isn't much of an energetic cost, the degeneracy wins out, okay? So initially, this degeneracy 2j plus one is more important, right? But this is just a linear effect, okay? There's no square, there's no exponential terms. But when the exponential decay effect is small, why? Because the separation in energy down here is small. Because the rotational states are getting further and further apart as I go up in J, this exponential decay will begin to win out. Okay, and hopefully you can understand that. All right, but I'll repeat it again. At first, 2j plus 1 is more important. So the number of molecules in the first excited state will actually be more than the number in the ground rotational state. Why? Because of this 2j plus 1 degeneracy of that first excited state. Now, 
you know, you could argue that instead of drawing a single rotational state here, I should probably for the first rotational state draw three, right? And then draw five, right? And then draw seven, but that gets very convoluted. So we just usually draw a single line, but there are degenerate states there. So J equals one, J equals two is more populated than J equals one, which is more populated than J equals zero. Okay, however, as J gets large, maybe J equals seven or eight or so, for example, the exponential decay now more than compensates for that increasing in degeneracy. which means that j equals maybe six, will actually be less populated than j equals two. And maybe j equals 12, because of all the exponential decay from it being a really high energy state, will more than compensate for the two j plus one uh, degeneracy here, compared to even the single degenerate state of j equals zero. Okay, so what we would expect in this row vibrational spectrum, which will have to do with how many molecules are in a given energy level to absorb the radiation to begin with, okay? We would expect in this, you know, just thinking about the R branch, if we want to draw this out in terms of energy, uh, sorry, in terms of intensity as a function of energy, right? we can say, well, maybe, you know, J equals four is the most intense. Okay, so that's what I'll draw here. This is J equals four. And J equals three is less intense. And J equals two is less intense. And J equals one is less intense. All right, so these are all the beginning J state. So this, this transition right here is actually J uh, zero to J one, I should say, J one to J two. Well, we can draw another one here. We'll say this is J equals zero. So this is zero to one, one to two, two to three, three to four, four to five. And maybe J four is most intense in this example. But now that I get to J equals five, right, there is a energetic cost to being an energy state five as opposed to four, right? And the spacing between these two peaks, I'd set this up for one and zero, but you could set it up again for five and four, right? Although the degeneracy would be, well, we could figure it out here, one, three, five, seven, nine, I think, and 11. Right, or we could even compare it, maybe it's better to think about it and compare it to the zeroth state, right? Even though this degeneracy term is much greater, right? We get a, a factor of 11 supporting that the population up here in state five might be greater. Well, this energy difference that's up in the exponential is going to be a large negative that's really going to decay the population. So this number is getting really, really small fast now. And so that more than compensates for this original degeneracy argument we were talking about. Okay, I'll just replace this really quick for the two we were talking about earlier. So now that I get to five, well, maybe now five starts to decrease. And I should draw these pretty similarly closely spaced together. And then maybe four, or sorry, six is here. And then maybe seven is here and then maybe eight, nine, 10, et cetera. 
Now, one other thing we can comment on, right? Yes, the exponential decay over here on the right is more than compensating. And so, you know, J equals 10's row vibrational peak to J equals 11 is going to be much less intense than J equals four, but even less intense than J equals zero. But we can also comment on the shape here. Maybe I'll use a different color here. We can comment on the shape here of the actual increase here. This is linear. Whereas this side is going to be an exponential. Why? Because it's the exponential decrease that's winning out in the overall population here, right? This is the exponential decay versus this that is the degeneracy benefit or the entropy, you could think about it, benefit of being in that excited state, okay? So now we fully understand the basic shape of this whole spectrum, right? We've talked about in the previous lecture why there is a P branch and an R branch, why there isn't a peak in the middle here because of selection rules, why the spacing of the R branch is less than the spacing of the P branch, because it's not a perfect rigid rotor, and higher energy states actually lead to a longer equilibrium bond length, which leads to a lower spacing between energetic states. But now we also understand why this increase is linear, and then this is a pretty exponential-ish looking function here. Okay, so that really does it for this lecture where we wanted to explain the shapes of row vibrational spectroscopy. Okay, again, this is only using IR light. If you're using microwave light, you don't get shapes like this because you only are seeing rotational to rotational transitions within a given vibrational level. All right, you only get all of this P branch and R branch for an individual vibration using IR light. And the molecule could have multiple vibrations, so you could have different P and R branches at different energies out here, right? At some higher energy because this is a different vibration that you're thinking about. Okay, so that'll do it for this lecture, finishing out rotational spectroscopy. Next lecture, we're gonna move on and cover molecular spectroscopy and Raman spectroscopy in particular, before then moving on to uh, vibronic, which is electronic and vibrational spectroscopy after that. See you then.